I, I represent uh, another one of the test beds, so I'm going to actually be sort of on the panel and moderating the panel as we go along here. And one of the things that we've learned in the operation of, of our particular activities is that we needed to have a much clearer, much more precisely defined concept for an architecture for how these kinds of connected intelligent transportation systems could work with each other. And so we've spent quite a bit of time over the last two years putting together this reference architecture. That's one of the things that we have been making available then to all of our stakeholder communities so that they can use that as a reference for how to organize their particular activities. And one of the main features of this reference architecture is the understanding that you need to have a complete portfolio of communication uh, media and abilities available in order to accomplish all of the things that we would like to do. There is no one particular medium that does everything, and particularly if you look at this from the perspective of the traveler or the moving elements of a system like this, having access to a complete portfolio of these communication media allows you to accomplish a lot of the things you'd like to do in a much more reliable, robust, uh, available kind of a context. So we're very anxious to find out uh, how well these kinds of melding of communication media work. In the concept we've been working with, we have media available that have everything from a continent-wide reach to a very close reach in geographic scope. So we envision people using everything from satellite-based communications to things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth as all part of their implementations. We're very much looking forward to the next generation of uh, <clears throat> these mobile networks because we see the possibility of much better coordination among all of these radio access technologies in this next generation of mobile networks. Much more so than the kind of ad hoc hodgepodge approach that you have to take with today's uh, media if you try to bridge these things together. So we're very much looking forward to that next generation and the opportunity to include all of the types of communication media that we think are necessary to accomplish intelligent transportation systems. So with that, I'd like to begin introducing the members of the panel and giving them an opportunity to give their perspective on the role that communication plays in the work, maybe point out a few things that they've learned and the evolution in their thinking. So I'm just gonna start with Ray, who is uh, closest to me. We are in uh, partnership with the Virginia Department of Transportation in operating what we call the Virginia Connected Corridor. For those of you who live in the area, Northern Virginia, or are just visiting, um, I'm sure you very quickly realize you are in one of the most congested areas in the United States. Depending on what measure you look at, we're usually number one or number two. Um, VDOT is, um, obviously takes this issue very seriously. If you look on and travel the road, such as on Interstate 66, you'll see we have some of the most heavily instrumented um, roads um, in the nation. Um, VDOT has just implemented an advanced traffic management um, system along I-66, trying to address the congestion. Um, but in their um, really almost desperation to provide service to the taxpayers of the Commonwealth, um, the existing state-of-the-art technology in ITS um, isn't doing everything they need. So they really see connected vehicles um, technology as being um, the next step forward. So about three years ago, um, they funded the development of the Northern Virginia testbed. So we installed um, over 60 um, DSRC-based roadside units um, going back as far, out as far as Gainesville, um, and then all the way, um, we're about to install up to the district line, and then along parallel routes of 50 and 29. Um, initially, um, this was funded in part with a USDOT-funded University uh, Transportation Center project, which funded the research, but um, VDOT, as the primary funder of the facility, has to provide value to, um, to the taxpayers. So we don't see it as just a test bed, but we have to be able to demonstrate the value to the consumer. So we are transitioning it to what we call the Virginia Connected Corridor. And in that transition, we are developing applications 
that will utilize both DSRC but also cellular so we can greatly expand not only the footprint of the corridor um, but also those that are able to use um, the information um, that's coming out of it. So right now um, VDOT has an application that runs off their 511, uh, a uh, cellular version of their 511 system and we're expanding that to pull in the information that's coming off our DSRC vehicles as well as cellular probes to provide applications um, to, um, to the citizens. And that's really the evolution that's changed from being solely a DSRC-based system to encompassing uh, cellular as well. So we can uh, really provide a bigger bang for the buck in the short term until DSRC is well deployed. Next is David. It, I think y'all are going to hear um, a lot of similarity uh, from those of us here at the panel. And, and I think uh, it's important to, to know as a caveat that what we're going to talk about really isn't inconsistent or competitive. It's, it's actually leverageable. So a lot of the work that all of us are doing, led by you know, the DOT in this re regard, these are become ultimately localized opportunities uh, that may have applicability across the country, but um, if you picture yourself within the context of a, of a road owner in a certain jurisdiction, what does all this mean for me and how do I implement it and so forth. So let me just talk a little bit about uh, TTI, which is the Texas A&M Transportation Institute and specifically the Accelerate Texas program we have. And, I, and a lot of the questions that I've changed what I want to talk about, uh, so I'll try to address, not answer them, but try to address some of the context that we're looking at in Texas here based on the questions earlier today. First of all, TTI is a, a, a very large research organization uh, affiliated with the university. It's probably one of the largest ones uh, in the country. And that covers everything, not just from automobiles and highways, but sea, air, uh, rail, uh, all kinds of modes, all kinds of traffic, all kinds of transit and freight. Um, Accelerate Texas uh, itself is a program focused not so much on uh, research inside of this research organization, but more in terms of commercialization and what can happen today. And the Accelerate Texas program is really a partnership between Texas DOT and the A&M system. And part of the idea there is, okay, what, while all this is going on, how do we create the right kind of economic environment to have early stage deployments, leverage other things that are going on across the country, and start providing the safety and mobility benefits that we need today? And so we did a few things in that respect. Um, so first of all, if you think about uh, you know, 50 years from now, uh, assume, you know, I'll predict everything will be automated. It will be totally autonomous driving. Hold me accountable to that 50 years from now. Um, but the question then is, what do we do in the meantime, and how does all this work? Well, in Texas, like in virtually every other state, you have very fragmented ownership of roadways. You have a Texas DOT that probably controls 25% of the road miles, but accounts for 70, more than 75% of the actual traffic. And then you have counties, then you have cities, and you have other localities that might be involved. You also have privately owned infrastructure under concession arrangements. So you have a very fragmented uh, set of ownership. The TIA, um, I remember from the annual meeting this year, the TIA talks about uh, 4 billion connected devices growing to 50 billion connected devices. So just think about the environment where you have that much data and connectivity flowing and you have various um, public sector actors who are involved in the IT side who look at uh, the operational side of the IT part of their service. Uh, is a, is a very scarce budget item and they're very challenged to try to address that and, and how is that going to happen. <coughs> you look at legislation and I'll talk about Texas there. Um, there's, there's a, uh, you know, the fact is there just is no enabling legislation in, in Texas. Now, other people may say there's no disabling legislation in Texas. There just isn't any. And that's because of a long-standing tradition of why pass a law before there's a need to pass the law. And that, as a result, has attracted companies like Google to, to come and start uh, field testing their vehicle in Austin uh, as their first foray outside of uh, California for major testing areas. So that's the kind of environment. And, you know, so when you take a look at all these things, um, that's the, the context of what we're operating in, within today. 
And what we had done is we had take, taken a look at uh, what's going on, and, and we relied on a McKinsey study to do this. We took a look at the ITS industry, and McKinsey picked on, in addition to that, picked three specific areas inside of an automobile. You know, the technology in the car, the connectivity to the cloud, and then the cloud services and, and other data uh, handling. So those are, you know, those kind of encompass a variety of things. And so we took a look at that and said, okay, well, these are the areas that have to be part and parcel to any kind of implementation, and obviously connections, uh, connectivity is part of that. And what we found, we convened a group of a, kind of a cross-section of these public sector road owners, along with uh, automakers, uh, OEM suppliers, ITS companies, and, and cloud service and data providers. And we found that there were like four main areas of focus that were very important to start focusing on initially. One is procurement models. Uh, the second one is communications and data sharing. A third area is standards. And a fourth is road readiness. And I think there were a lot of questions earlier today that kind of touch in each of those areas. So that's kind of consistent with what our findings were uh, in Texas. And what we've done as a result is we've issued the first in a series of what we'll call RFIs to start uh, deploying and generating um, trials of vehicles that are ready today to help improve safety and mobility in the state of Texas. Uh, just because it has such a big consequence. And the consequence there is you have a $1.2 trillion economy in what's known as the Texas Triangle between Dallas, Houston, Austin, and that area. Very dense urban congestion, very remote rural parts of the highways and roads and, and so forth, and multi-jurisdictional ownership throughout this whole area. Um, and how do you make all this work? So. That's kind of our constituent stakeholders that we want, that are eager to try to find solutions today uh, along that roadmap of the ultimate conversion 50 years from now when we're all autonomous. And so I'll, I'll leave it with that for now. Okay, and lastly, we have Peter Swetman from uh, University of Michigan. Thank you, Walt. Scott, thanks for the invitation today, appreciate it. Um, so, uh, University of Michigan, we were fortunate enough to be entrusted with the USDOT's safety pilot model deployment for V2V and a bit of V2I um, uh, a few years ago now, back in 2012. And so we've been running uh, up to 3,000 connected vehicles in the city of Ann Arbor. It's a city of about 140,000 people um, for three years now, or a little over three years. So collected a lot of data and a lot of that data was used to back up the uh, the rulemaking moves being made by NHTSA, which hopefully will, will come to fruition. Um, and then something very interesting happened. Uh, I mean, this is something that really from the point of view of a great university like the University of Michigan, um, where it's publish, publish. And here we were doing this sort of, uh, the work of, looked a bit like a car dealership. We were fitting up 40 vehicles a day, volunteers vehicles with the technology. We weren't writing any, any reports, let alone any, any scholarly papers or anything like that. But what shone through from what we were doing to everybody at the university and everyone around southeastern Michigan up to the <coughs> governor was that this was truly transformational, that, that connected vehicles, connected infrastructure uh, was going to pave the way to a new 21st century mobility system that we always kind of dreamed of, but we never quite got there. So, so that was pretty important. And around about the same time, we started hearing a lot from uh, Silicon Valley about about automated vehicles and so on. And of course, the the Michigan companies and co automakers all around the world and Tier One suppliers have been pretty active on that technology for a while, but they hadn't been saying much about it. Um, so we ended up uh, with this great opportunity to stand up a center, we called it the Mobility Transformation Center. Um, we, and the whole idea there was to take, uh, to converge connected and automated technologies and uh, work to get the most accelerated deployment and the widest deployment we could possibly get. And in order to do that, we kind of changed the university research model around, put it back to front, where we do these big deployments like the 3,000 vehicles in Ann Arbor, and then we b build our research on top of that. And that way, 
we learn a lot faster. And so that's the way we proceeded. Um, along the way, we built uh, M-City, which I think you've probably all heard about, uh, the fake city for testing uh, automated and connected vehicles, which we launched in July. We had about a thousand people at the launch. Um, I'm pleased to say that M-City is uh, now fully operational. It's fully booked. It's completely booked. Um, we do two organized tours every day. We had to buy a bus so that we could take bigger groups of people out to see M City. So um, I think it, it's it's turned out pretty well. And I think apart from uh, you know we're kind of chuffed with the way it all went, but uh, I think it's indicative really of this incredible transformation that we're seeing. We heard references to that I think all day today. So. We are in a new paradigm for mobility and tra uh, transportation. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're thrilled to be part of that. Uh, we're building our connected deployment in the city of Ann Arbor up to 9,000 vehicles from 3,000. Um, we are <coughs> working co closely with the city of Ann Arbor on applications, safety applications of interest to them. And, most of those relate to pedestrian safety. Pedestrian safety in a, in a city with so many students, 50,000 students, uh, is a key issue for the city. And so, you know, we're very interested in all players being connected uh, in, in the city of Ann Arbor. Um, and, and then we're, we're building out to a larger deployment uh, across southeastern Michigan, and our target there is 20. 20,000 connected vehicles. Um, so I kind of think of it as a kind of a Russian doll thing. We've got M City, which is 32 acres, 13 signalized intersections, and we're really focusing on automated and connected and bringing those two technologies together. Then we can we spill out onto the streets of Ann Arbor in a fully connected environment, and then we can go out onto the streets of uh, southeastern Michigan, including the freeways and so on, um, the ramps and all, all the aspects, uh, also in a, in a fully connected environment. So um, we're very uh, excited about that. We've had a lot of support from the state. Um, we have 54 companies uh, signed up to MTC, all putting, making a financial contribution. 16 of them are putting a million dollars in. 38 of them are putting in uh, 150,000. So it's a substantial research program that's being enabled through that. Uh, we've already got about $4 million worth of research program projects underway. Uh, a lot of those, there was some discussion this morning about the human factors issues here with uh, the driver having to re-engage and that type of thing. Um, so a number of our projects are currently related to that. Uh, we have uh, the Umtree driving simulator has been repurposed to, as an automated driving experience. So we can create M-City in the simulator and, and all of that. So, um, so this discretionary reason, I mean, I think for anyone in a university, a, in a university institute, having discretionary funding is, is the holy grail. And so our, um, industry participation at, that, at the level we have it is really helping us to do that, do the research that needs to be done. So we work with our partners to figure out what the main barriers to deployment are, and then we work on, we base the research around that. So Walt, um, I might leave it at that, but we're, we've got a fair bit going on in uh, southeastern Michigan. Okay, I appreciate those brief introductions, and um, I'll have a couple of questions, and then we'll take questions from the audience. And Scott, I really appreciate this kind of blending of transportation and telecommunications people in the room here. So the first question that I'm going to ask of these transportation people is telecommunications oriented. Um, we're all very interested in this topic of connected vehicles and the requirements that it's going to place upon the telecommunications industry in order to support it. The question I have for the panel, and I'm gonna actually answer last because I've got my own number guess in, in this particular question, 
Is any of the work that you've been doing or any of the people that you've been working with giving you an idea of the quantity of communication that's going to be needed in these connected or self-driving vehicles that people are starting to talk about? Are you seeing any, any early indicators of what kind of a burden this is going to place on the telecommunications side of the equation? We, um, I can't quantify that, but the, um, I think from the get-go, it was obviously a perceived issue. So a lot of the work we are doing is focusing on how to cut down that burden on the telecommunications infrastructure. So we're working with Federal Highway and the car manufacturers through the CAMP consortium on how do you transition, um, how do you support mobility applications without overburdening the uh, safety channel with the BSM, the safety message. So we have a project on a new basic mobility message. And from the get-go, we're looking at how do you decrease the frequency of transmission, and how does the infrastructure get smart enough to start um, telling the vehicles, you don't need to talk to me so much. I have enough information right now. Um, so out of that, we'll get some data to, um, to support that kind of analysis. David, anything coming out of your work? You know, I, I go back to the four billion to fifty billion connected devices that the TIA talks about, and so you got an order of magnitude. But I think probably the growth in the data is higher than that, and I think some of the earlier discussions about what's data, what's information, is the key point because you have to d uh, differentiate between what you need to take action with versus you know data you can just let go. You you see it coming, you don't need it. And so if you're driving your car, just think about if everything is normal. And this goes back to, IT, you know, these are going to be ITS type lessons. Uh, if things are acting in normal state, what's the key, what are the key metrics, what's the key information? I don't need to know that every 10 feet this car was progressing along and what its speed was every, you know, so often. I could take a look at a trip. And if a trip was the relative issue, then, then I could bound that trip just by selecting certain data that's involved with that. And so, you know, part of, as, as Ray's mentioned, you know, it's, it's being able to, to discern what's going on. And that happens already in the, uh, in the ITS world. It, I don't think it happens as much in the Internet of Everything, you know, space, because everybody's taking a look at all the data that's coming out. But there are some pretty... Uh, sophisticated system engineering activities that have always gone on in the ITS world in terms of here's the data that's relevant you know we want to get access to all the data whatever it may be because I don't know yet if it's if I need it or not but then being able to sort through all that the challenge is going to be okay once you figure all that out what's the business model and how do you monetize uh, you know to justify the investment in the infrastructure necessary to handle all that all that data that that's the that's the big question that we all have because if people are thinking that um, a state transportation or a local transportation agency is responsible for that data, well, maybe it is around the, how the road network operates. Uh, the car performance data, maybe it's the, the automobile. You know, what, what's the personal routes? Maybe that's the, per, you know, the individual that's there. So it's a fairly complex uh, area, and, and I know that... Uh, you know, TTI and others have been looking at, you know, the personal information that can be accessible through this and kind of what the whole regulatory environment is around that is trying to study where, where those things are, are falling out. And it, it's not de well defined yet. It's uh, still a work in process and a way to go. And to, and to couple that, um, if you just think about any kind of governmental agency, they, they are budget constrained today. And, and most transportation agencies can always get funding to go build something, you know, that's big and significant. But it's the operational cost, which is where typically this uh, uh, information flow is going to come, is going to roll up in terms of, you know, the responsibility inside of a, of a road agency. Uh, how do I pay for this? Well, it's operating budgets, and they don't have operating funds. They can always build a new lane. They can always do another exit ramp. They can build a new stretch of highway. But it's very difficult for them to increase their operational budget in today's economy. Any anything coming out of the tea leaves in, in your cup, there, Peter? Yeah, thanks. Well, so well, I guess you know what we've learned is it's all, there's always more data than you think, 
And uh, we, for example, with the DSRC radios, it turned out the range was uh, three or four times what we thought it was going to be. So you got three or four times, at least three or four times as many vehicles in your catchment as you think. Um, so you have to recalculate all the time. I guess the other indicator to me is that if you think about the cost, you know, and we, we still haven't figured out how to deploy <coughs> radios in the infrastructure. You know, and Ashto have made various sort of global estimates of what that's going to cost. But in our experience in Ann Arbor, whatever that cost is, about half of it is related to data backhaul. And we, and we were fortunate that in the city of Ann Arbor, we were able to use the city of Ann Arbor's fiber optic network. So we didn't have the full cost of, of what that might, might otherwise be. So in, in a city the size of Ann Arbor, the infrastructure cost to us um, to, to be ready for say 10,000 vehicles is about a million dollars. Um, and half of that roughly is to take, take care of the data backhaul. So, um, that it's a very, so that tells me it's, we better make sure we get it right in terms of what data we are going to collect and what we're going to use it for um, and who's going to own it and all those kind of questions are pretty important. Okay, well, I guess I'll wrap up by giving you my, the, my answer to my own question. <laughs> One of the things that we tried to do when we were working on this reference architecture was to step back from uh, trying to prejudge um, a solution based on current constraints. And we wanted to take a mo uh, maybe a little bit broader approach and a, a what if approach. What if all of this data were available from all of the moving vehicles in the environment? How much would it be? And what could you do with it? Or what could somebody do with it? So we, we actually used that little microscopic installation that we have in downtown Detroit that had been built up for the last ITS World Congress that had taken place there and did some uh, experimenting with what if we transported every data unit created by a vehicle as it moves through its environment off of the vehicle and got it somewhere where somebody could do something with it? How much would it be? We did a little rough back of the envelope kind of a calculation based on a time of day, day of week, area of the country kind of a thing and came up with a typical vehicle, kind of a uh, 50th to 75 percentile vehicle would create about four to six gigabytes of data per month of operating. And okay, that's somebody maybe thinks that's a lot. People who are in the telecommunications industry who are used to supplying uh, pipes for streaming video, that you wouldn't even notice that. Um, so anyway, it's somewhere in the middle there. And then what could you do with that? And actually, the thing that kind of inspired me to think this way was actually Ken. One of the first things he came out of his mouth when I first met him when he came into the office was that when, when we have this when and if we have this NHTSA mandate, those vehicles out there are going to be hyper aware of their location. X, Y, and Z, vertical. What if you were to take all of those data units that are created and look at the Z dimension as those vehicles go across a bridge? Could you tell something about the state of health of that bridge by the pattern of the vehicles as they go across? We all know that those structures oscillate when vehicles go across. Could you look at that pattern, develop a signature for a healthy bridge and then maybe predict when that bridge is about to reach a catastrophic failure point. We have like, Carl probably knows the number, we have like 30,000 bridges that in the United States alone that have been deemed uh, letter grade F. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to drive over them if you knew that uh, they were really that bad. Could we use this as a way of monitoring the state of health of all of those bridges? So that's part of the, uh, what we kind of tried to build into this architecture concept of uh, what we're working with and what we're hoping that people experiment with in this next round is if you take away some of the preconceived constraints that people have, what could you do with it? What kind of magic could happen in that kind of a situation? And then that may end up answering the how do you pay for it question. So anyway, four to six gigabytes per vehicle per month. Um, you can do the math at what kind of burden that would place on the telecommunications industry. Probably isn't a significant burden. So anyway, um, that's kind of 
thinking we would like to see you know bring to the bring from the telecommunications industry to us is how would you accommodate that and you know if you had it what could you do with it so anyway next question uh, kind of gets at the how do we pay for it question and you know as you guys have been operating your installations and have been interacting with potential you know, users and dealing with your stakeholder communities locally are there some kind of early indications of what the killer app is going to be for the connected and intelligent uh, vehicle out there is there something that is starting to come to the forefront the thing that everybody would like to have if it were available. We, uh, back when this was called the VII program, um, back in 95-ish time. Yeah, back um, before I had all of this gray hair. That was uh, probably on day two, we were all asking, well, what's the killer app? And uh, all these years later, uh, I haven't found it yet. Um, there's always a willingness to get the other guy. We formed this executive leadership team meeting between the road operators and the car companies, and they spent about two months looking at each other, um, trying to talk past each other and get the other guy to pay for everything. So um, we didn't make a lot of success on that. Um, since I have gone to Virginia Tech and worked closely with VDOT, um, we haven't found, we found a lot of things we want to do, not necessarily a lot that are going to make a profit for anybody. Um, but an interesting issue that has come up is you would expect a road operator to be very, to hold the data really close to the vest and not want to relinquish um, control over it. But they, but seeing all these costs and not wanting to get tied up in the long-term operational costs, they have gotten very willing to give away big parts of the system um, and bring in the private, um, you know, private providers to operate the backhaul. Um, and let them try and figure out how to pull value out of it. So um, I don't have an answer for an application, but very more of a, a process of VDOT is looking at bringing more people to the table to share that burden. Yeah, I think the, uh, the killer app from uh, our perspective at TTI is kind of twofold. You have the population in the state expected to double from, to about 50 million people by 2050. It's always, it has been shown that well-designed ITS infrastructure can help reduce the cost of expensive capital projects. So the killer app is how do you get further mobility, from our point of view, uh, further mobility out of an existing infrastructure, which is not really that different from other, you know, ITS history. And, um, because it's a longer term issue and maybe that killer app is the being able to reduce the headway. So for all of us in here, when we got our driver's licenses, you were supposed to travel no closer than two seconds behind the car in front of you at whatever speed you were going. But maybe that's going to get cut to just a, a very specific amount of distance that, that the cars uh, do with themselves. So I think being able to put more uh, traffic flow on an existing highway and do it safely is, is the key. But the most important uh, killer app really is the safety part of the app. Um, I think if, uh, you know, we've been trying to wrestle with this, but, you know, and there were some conversations earlier today about some very high percentages of accidents and fatalities are really caused by the driver. And while all that is true, um, how do you uh, be able to reduce that and then and then have the social benefit of the of the reduced fatality come back into uh, you know being able to help fund some of that infrastructure and, and there were some conversations about the insurance industry as an example. And so some of this is speculative but you know maybe transportation becomes a service, not not a uh, not your own car where you buy your own maintenance, you buy your own vehicle, you buy your own insurance, but maybe you just pay for it on an a la carte basis. And that's within a a context of a, an autonomous environment. So again, that's something 50 years from now, and you can hold me accountable for that prediction 50 years from now. Um, but the safety piece of it in terms of human life and, and the cost saved from that uh, by reducing those fatalities, while there isn't necessarily money, you know, if you think about it from a business model standpoint, how does it get paid for? Um, 
you know, those, those are the difficult questions, but that's really the killer app. Uh, it's the safety and mobility pieces. And, and, and those are kind of consistent, I think, with all our states and all of our DOTs with what, what the main priorities are for this technology. But doesn't, we were thinking of killer app as what are we gonna, what's gonna pay for this? Yeah. And I think you're in the same situation where there's a lot of good things you can do with this. Very difficult to monetize that and bring them back to actually fund the deployments. I mean, Agree. No one's going to argue that what we're all trying to do is, isn't good, but how to pay for it is still an open question. So I think, I think the, um, the killer, killer app is the platform itself. We, I think we often overthink this and we think about all the, all the applications and, you know, in our case in the safety pilot, we had six selected applications. But, but what we fundamentally found when we talked to the users, the, the volunteers in Ann Arbor who've had this technology for a period of years, they like to know that other vehicles know they're there. So if you're driving a car, you want to know that the trucks know you're there. If you're riding a motorcycle, you want to know that the cars know you're there. That's step one. People, people are really happy to know that. So the details of exactly what kind of, how these apps are going to work uh, doesn't matter so much, maybe. The, the other killer app, it's not really a killer app, but I guess because we've pulled this ecosystem of companies together, it's pretty broad, the, after, the automotive aftermarket industry for some years now has been um, trying to figure out, trying to deal with ADAS systems, you know, advanced safety systems in vehicles. How do we know they're still working? How do we know they're still in compliance? Um, and so they've, they've become quite sophisticated. And also there's this attitude of, well, if, if these technologies are going to be available in a, in a new vehicle, or maybe, and they would suspect probably in a luxury vehicle, then they ought to be available in the aftermarket. And there are some fantastic companies in the automotive aftermarket who are just dying to get their hands on this technology and sell it. Um, then you take them and you hook them up with the, the least likely alliance you could possibly think of is the um, traffic control industry. They're natural allies. They, they're forming a sort of an axis because the traffic control industry would love to be able to use V2I to, to do all kinds of great things for traffic control, but they need the density of deployment out there and they recognize that their greatest ally in getting that density of deployment in the vehicles is the automotive aftermarket industry. So I'll vote for that as the, the killer app to get this stuff going. Okay, I think from the, the thread of the comments here, uh, Scott, you're seeing the beautiful marriage, Ken, the beautiful marriage between transportation and telecommunications here is actually the, the thing that uh, is, is the, the big thing in the room. It's not a particular use for it, but it's what you could do with it when they come together. So my last question then uh, for the panel, um, I'll start on Peter's end this particular time. Is there anything unique about a self-driving vehicle as opposed to uh, a human-driven vehicle in this communication context? Is one radically different than the other? Well, I, I think, uh, so basically I think in, that, in the automated context, um, you know, DSRC communication is really another sensor and so it's a very affordable and very powerful sensor it's an unusual sensor but it's really another sensor but but I do want to comment on you know and I, I think I started off by saying we set up MTC to um, for the convergence of connected and automated technology but that convergence is not happening um, so the only example I can think of where you must have connected and automated is platooning. So platooning, we've got short headways, so we must have that, the connected aspect as well. Um, but we've got a long way to go to converge these two technologies. If I look at the 54 companies we have engaged at MTC, a little more than half of them are interested in uh, connected vehicles. A little le less than half are interested in automated vehicles and less again are interested in both. So the whole uh, industrial side of this has got a long way to go and it's you know we need to I think part of the value of our centers that 
uh, you've got three represented here, is how we're going to move that forward. So this is just, right now, it's just an idea. And I think we all feel, most of us feel, that connectivity is going to be very important to automation. And it's going to support automation. It's going to, if you've got a connected zone, connected city like Ann Arbor, uh, then that's going to be a, a logical place to test automated technologies. But um, it's very early days yet. So it rolls off the tongue to say connected and automated, but uh, they're essentially two separate technologies uh, as we sit here today. Interesting observation. David? And, and to, to answer your, your question about the human, I'll come back to the, that in a second. The way we're, we're looking at that, uh, the connected and automated piece uh, at A&M is, is primarily, um, this could sound very simplistic, uh, but you can have a connected car that's not automated, and, but you can't really have an automated car that doesn't have connectivity, whether it's an actual communications or you're connected to your surroundings by sensing uh, your environment. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it, I agree with everything Peter said. I think in terms of, uh, you know, the difference between an automated vehicle and a human vehicle. Um, on the one hand, the automated vehicle, and, and, and this is the concept design, if you will, you know, you have 360 degree awareness uh, in an automated vehicle. You know it's coming around you at all times, even if you're not looking that, in that direction. So just picture yourself driving your own car. You know, if you're doing a good job, you're, you're looking in your mirrors, you're, you're being aware of what's going on around you. Uh, but the benefit of the automated vehicle is it, it can help you see things through its technology and its sensors that you cannot see as a human. Uh, there might be uh, snow on the road. There could be, it could be dark and no lighting. It could be very poor retroreflectivity on the roadside. Um, so there's a whole host of other things that uh, truly fully automated vehicles should be able to help deliver more than what you can as a human. On the other hand, uh, you know, the human has a lot of judgment. You know, if you're aware and alert, you know, you can take action as you need to. And while that's being developed, you know, you're, you're relying on machine language and code and, and other things. And, uh, you know, how do you model up the human brain on knowing what to do when, when to do it? So those are, those are some of the challenges there. Any differences that you're seeing in the work that's done in your facility, right? Um, you know, I, I kind of agree with everything Peter said, except for his basic premise. <laughs> um, I really feel strongly that an automated vehicle is a connected vehicle. And where we differ is on the technology. I think what Pe Peter meant is you don't need DSRC. But there's not an automated vehicle out there, I'm talking about level four or five, um, that doesn't have at least cellular communications. Um, they need mapping updates. They need, infra even the Google car needs to get updates um, into it and needs, um, needs to know where it's allowed to operate. And that's the difference between the human-driven car and an automated vehicle. An automated vehicle will require some type of communications outside. Obviously, we can all drive our cars without our cell phone or uh, any other communications. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, I agree with Peter, it's yet to be figured out how do we make sure that the connected vehicle, the automated vehicles of the future are leveraging all the benefits of DSRC as well as whatever, what, what any other uh, communication link that we have in there. Yeah, I mean, I think I was <clears throat> taking a pretty strict definition of connected. But uh, Walt, maybe I could just make one other comment, and it came up earlier. Um, so one of the real sleeper issues, I think, is that um, humans cheat and machines are programmed, do what they're programmed to do and they're generally programmed to be conservative. So all mach automotive machines we, we know about at the moment tend to be, you know, they tend to be, go a little slower or a little further away from another vehicle, uh, allow, you know, the margin for error kind of idea. Uh, so the lawyers uh, tend, to, tend to win out. So we have this so when we get to this mix, this hybrid situation we're going to go through for at least a decade where we've got uh, vehicles of various levels of automation and human controlled vehicles all operate, you know, going to be on separate lanes, they're all going to be mixing it in together, then so that the human is cheating, either going faster, shorter headway, whatever it is, and, 
and the machine is programmed to be conservative and there's a huge gap. And so it's going to require us to get real about what, there's got to be one, one rule. And otherwise it's, not, it's definitely not going to work. So what is that one rule? And it can't be unduly conservative because we had the interesting conversation with the senator um, where a whole tenor of that conversation was, well, we all, all tend to go a little faster than we should. And it's true. Um, but of course, the machines don't don't operate that way, and that is a recipe for disaster. I just have one thing to throw out there. There was a funny incident that happened with the Google car in Austin. So, any people or bikers in here, you know what kickstanding is. So, you know it's when you're pedaling up and you need to slow down and almost stop because of something else is coming, and so you kind of hit the brakes and then you pedal just a tad and hit the brake and you're balancing. So it was coming into an intersection between the Google car and this guy kickstanding along the way, and, and neither of them would go because you couldn't tell <laughs> what was happening. And so the, it was a very interesting learning experience for the Google car in Austin on, on that. <laughs> okay, that was the last of the questions I had. Are there any telecommunications-oriented questions people in the audience would like to ask this particular transportation-oriented panel? Can, um, can you each talk about what you're doing with respect to security and, and, the, and how you're um, managing that and testing out security protocols? I, I can answer that really fast. We're waiting for Walt to provide us with the new security system. <laughs> yeah, as is everybody else in the world right now. <laughs> I will say um, I'm, a, I'm part of a group called InfraGuard, and I don't know if other people, I'm sure somebody else in here is uh, with InfraGuard. So it's a public-private partnership between the FBI and the private sector where, you know, we're able to see and become party to some classified information about cyber threats. Uh, so you have to go through clearance process and so forth. So I would encourage every, everybody um, who really kind of wants to, to, to get up to speed and be more aware of these kind of situations. It's a, it's a great organization. We're actually trying to figure out um, about different special interest groups uh, around the transportation area, uh, and specific, I know there's one up in Michigan, and, and uh, uh, there's a lot in the maritime area and obviously the aviation area, but there needs to be more around the cyber community, not just from a design standpoint, but then what do you do after you design the technology? How do you stay abreast of what all the threats are as they're coming along? And that's really where this government-private sector relationship could pay some benefits. I-N-F-R-A-G-A-R-D, InfraGuard. Did you have any? I guess, well, my, my answer was a little flippant, but I, um, we are wait, waiting for that. But um, one, thing, one thing we've done is we've stood up a uh, cybersecurity lab at, at the university, and that's uh, a fascinating area. There's a lot of faculty leaping all over that now from all around the university. A lot of students, a lot of PhD students buying into that. Um, so I see that as being a very uh, exciting space for, for years to come around the mobile cybersecurity question. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that uh, the mobile side is a, a little behind, <coughs> behind the eight ball. So, you know, we're seeing a tremendous amount of entrepreneurship around cybersecurity in general. Uh, you know, it's an incredible space, whether it, whether you're talking Austin or you're talking Mountain View. Um, there's so much, so many startups, so many exciting cybersecurity companies out there. They're all going to, they haven't really started to impact on the transportation sector yet. And, you know, we're relying on this sort of government uh, security system for connected vehicles. Somehow that's all going to come together. It hasn't happened yet, but I think that's going to be very interesting when the private and the public sector solutions start to come together. And that's, um, I think, the critical role that USDOT plays. We have the Hume Center at Virginia Tech, which is our focus for cybersecurity, who are organizing our effort. They tend to focus on Defense Department work and also have a heavy uh, mobile device um, um, focus. Um, but none of us can afford, nor should we go out and build our own security solutions when we all need to work together, um, when we get all these vehicles and infrastructure deployed in the end anyway. So it's, it's not facetious, but we are all dependent on what Walt's doing. 
And um, I would just like to add that um, one of the things that we're trying to do in the department is to try to bring in work from elsewhere in the federal government that might be useful in this particular space. And one of the places that we have access to is NIST and all of their cybersecurity practices. So one of the things that we're attempting to do to help demystify all of those practices for the common practitioner in the intelligent transportation world is to build a feature into this architecture description tool that we're working with so that as you create your enterprise view and your physical view of your particular installation architecture, it will automatically point you to specific citations within the NIST body of work. So rather than you know getting a reference to the NIST website and having to sort it all out yourself for what's appropriate for a vehicle device of this particular class or an infrastructure device of that particular class or an organization of this particular type, uh, we'll try to give you more direct references to specific NIST citations as one of the features of that tool. Again, to help demystify that for the average practitioner. And question? Well, if I could just throw one, th one thing out. You know, I think uh, because we are part of universities, all of us have very extensive kind of capabilities that, that if you would like to, you know, uh, test something specific in a cyber environment, I think there's lots of uh, opportunities for that, but it needs to kind of come from the private sector or the government to initiate. Okay, so eventually the question will go to David. So you're the only person who used the term cloud computing. Okay. So my friend Martin and I were sitting here reflecting that we, we thought we were in a different meeting that we usually sit in on. And that meeting that we sit in on on the IT has to do with the cloud computing for aviation. Okay? okay. So after the disappearance of the Malaysian aircraft, the ITU was asked to come up with standards to look at the aviation cloud computing. In essence, what it does, it replicates the flight data recorder and the, uh, and the voice data recorder into a cloud computing environment. And we deal with the same exact data issues that you talked about, including how often do you sync up, how do you often do you collect the data, the scalability of the cloud, and the fee for service, okay? And we just pulled the data because the, the meeting concluded last week, right here from Martin's laptop. <coughs> and we noticed that for flight data recorder, 5.4 meg of data is collected per hour per airplane. This is only on the flight data recorder, not the voice data recorder. And assuming 20,000 aircraft, that would be 43 terabyte per month, okay? So we're talking about the same, I think FAA is part of DOT the last time I checked. <laughs> so, uh, so, so since you use the cloud computing, you're the only one who used the term cloud on the panel, David. So I'm wondering from the ITS side, how do you, <clears throat> how would you collect this data as to, as to why would you collect it in a cloud environment? Can I uh, just interject your one, one point real quick? Most of us come from the surface transportation world, Federal Highway Administration, right. and clouds tend to be the purview of the Federal Aviation Administration. <laughs> so you don't hear us use that much. term very often. <laughs> well, they, well, that's why they did a move down to, uh, they, they, they stayed on Independence Avenue. <laughs> Sorry, that was my bad joke of the day. Uh, David? Okay, so I think that's a great analogy. Okay, so um, you have a physical cloud, you know, in, in Walt's definition, but we'll talk about the virtual cloud. So, uh, you know, it, it, ignoring that even through a cloud, the data resides someplace. Okay, forget all that for a moment. But, and I don't know the, what's required in the aviation space, but, you know, just think about this. Um, if I'm flying an air, airplane, you know, let's take that example. Um, after that flight is done and everything went normal, Okay, uh, what is done with that data? Where does that data go? And, and whose cloud, if you will, does that sit on? So, you know, I don't know what those rules are, but imagine if that same kind of, you know, you're, you're doing this trip tracking, maybe you're communicating it to a cloud, uh, maybe not. Maybe 
everything remains inside of the vehicle except for basic safety data. You know, I don't, you know, you don't transmit uh, necessarily from, you know, because of the Malaysian example, uh, data wasn't being transmitted throughout the flight. You know, it, it's in that black box. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of information or decisions about are you going to uh, keep the whole trip data? What are you going to do with it? Where are you going to post it? So if I'm a fleet operator, I'll, I'll talk to it from a fleet perspective. If I'm a fleet operator, I may have a lot of interest in seeing how my, my drivers on, of my truck fleet behaved. So that might be of interest to me. So I might want to download that data. That's important to me. On the other hand, you know, or if I'm interested in how my kid is driving, I might be interested in that. But you know, not for how I'm driving. You know, I don't want anybody else to see that. So I want to make sure that that data gets erased. So you know, who has control and who has the decision making over that? And you know, if there is an accident, you know, there's a lot of conversation about you know who uh, and how you download that black box in the car, so to speak, to see who's at fault. Were you speeding through that intersection or or what have you? So did y'all have a did y'all come up with an answer um, in the aviation world on how to do this? That, that would maybe we could use as a as a model. Well, there. There's um, companies like here right now have started to stand up this type of capability. And in Virginia, we've modeled on that really a subscription. Everything goes in the cloud, but you don't keep everything or send it everywhere. Everyone subscribes and pulls off what they need. So it becomes a cost you understand. You, you get the burden of do you want to keep that data or are you just going to process it and let it go? Um, but we, you know, we've uh, assumed it'll go to the uh, what are you calling it, the operational data exchange? Um, there's all sorts of different uh, things in our architecture concept related to the movement of data and then ultimately where it's maybe uh, repository. But once again, Ken's going to pay for that. Yeah. Uh, or, or the example you're talking about is, you know, if uh, in a traffic flow environment, you know, if, if information can get back to that traffic operations center and you have different signal timing based on time of day or some other patterns that you have, you can go back and model that up and see what the best way is to, to right. They've subscribed for the right. data they want, not all That's right. of the data. But as David said, you know, even if the data is in the cloud, it's actually somewhere. And, you know, we had the City Mobile 2 folks over the week before last, and they did the La Rochelle project, you know, with the driverless shuttles, collected a lot of data. They were worried about the uh, privacy laws in France, so they grabbed the data and took it to Italy, <laughs> where there are no privacy <laughs> laws. So, you know, but that's an interesting thought as to, uh, you know, who can get access to the data and depending on how, how that's handled. So I don't know whether the cloud gives you any protection from that point of view or not. Is that why you're leaving for Italy after this event? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that uh, automated cars are going to are going to uh, rely on DSRC or radio links. Have you looked at how you're going to architect the network to recover in the event that you lose a radio node or two and how you recover in that kind of disaster? Um, I think I said the opposite, that we're not going to, automated vehicles will not rely on DSRC um, in the beginning. <coughs> Um, DSRC, as Peter said, is really a sensor to allow you to know what's going on around you. I think the required connectivity is up to the cloud, so you can get things like map updates and um, other kind of issues that the, um, that the operator will need for the vehicle. So it's, it's going to be a while before you have enough DSRC penetration on other vehicles as well as with the infrastructure that you that I would trust an automated vehicle that only relied on that. It, I think that's a really interesting question uh, in a, for a different reason. So what you're, I'm taking that as being what is the failover mode? Okay, what's the fault uh, environment? And so when we took a look at this in Texas, you know, part of this is what we call, you know, in, in a category called road readiness. And so right now the discussion is, okay, something fails on the connectivity, therefore the human driver is the failback. Um, right now, today, if a traffic signal loses power, 
or communications, it just starts blinking red and some alert through the network monitoring tells you send a tech out there to deal with it. So, you know, those are how things are routinely handled. But if you have a vehicle that's moving and, it, and everything fails for whatever reason, what does the car do? And I don't know the answer to this, but we talked about do we need to change something about our road infrastructure to create safe environments for vehicles to, you know, in a, in a, in a full-on failure mode uh, where a driver is not able to take the wheel to safely exit the road? And does that mean you have to change how roads are built and, and how they're constructed? Uh, do you have, uh, do the shoulders kind of become uh, failover stations, if you will, for existing highways? And if you're building a new road, uh, how, you know, what's the frequency of how you space that? At, we don't know any of the answers for that, but part of that is, you know, how you deal with a pure, flat out, everything fails in a car, especially if you don't have a steering wheel in the car, right? So um, I know there's been some interesting conversations with some uh, OEMs to, to, the, to the majors and talk about, well, let's have completely redundant systems inside the vehicles, but that ends up costing a lot of money, but it sure reduces the probability of that happening. Uh, are there predictive ways to go about trying to identify when that, that may happen? So these are kind of really good system engineering level you know, questions, but at the end of the day, how do you get that vehicle to stop safely? Um, and, and especially in an age in the future when people aren't driving all the time and, and they kind of lose the sharpness of driving skills and so on and so forth. So. You know, I, I, I don't think there's any real clear answer on that uh, today, unless Peter has one. Okay, well, I'd like to thank the members of the panel, and I'd like to thank Scott for inviting us to uh, participate in this activity. I've learned a lot, and I hope uh, you've learned something as well. Thank you. Thank you.